All right, everyone, welcome back. We're going to take our Cold War discussion and we are going to expand into Asia. Um, so before we really get into it, we really need to make sure that we understand some key vocabulary or key concepts before we keep building on anything else, right? Um, if we're talking about this, this word communism and over and over again, we should have a decent idea about what it is. Um, we should also be talking about question number two and three, but the most foundational question for the Cold War, right, is first we ask, what is the Cold War? And it's this fight between the Soviet Union and the USA for control and dominance over the world over the next couple of decades, 1945, 1990. But what are they fighting over? Influence, they want to push their own ideas around the world. The United States with democracy, which I think we have been a fine understanding of, and the Soviet Union pushing the ideas of communism. So we really need to make sure we understand what the word communism means. So to answer question number one, communism um, is a system of government. It also deals a little bit with economics, but we'll talk about it more so in the political realm when we're talking about things, um, where the ideas of classes and leveling wither away. They don't exist. So classes don't exist. The other thing to really take apart from this um, is understand that this is, comes into the socialism part, more the economic side of it, but everything is for the good of the community. And you may see that word commune in the root here of um, communism, right, right here. And we are focusing on the needs of everyone. So I am not going to give people an equal amount of stuff right? Say if I have money, if someone has more than they need, they're not going to get extra. I'm going to provide it to only those that are in need. Now to do that, I may take some of that from someone else. So private property doesn't really exist. The example I usually give is if you have a sibling um, and you both have money, right? Say, uh, or say one of you has no money, say you have $10 and your sibling has $0 and your parent, the government, takes that money and redistributes that wealth to people that need it. So what they'll do is they'll take it, they'll divide it in half, five will go to you, five will go to you, right? And when they split that up, the person that had more to begin with had higher personal property totals is gonna be upset, but the person who had less, that was a lower socioeconomic status, is gonna be happier. So it's gonna be better for the people on the lowest end of the socioeconomic status, the poor people, it attracts more. So America is going to try to counter this issue, right? Um, in number two of communism attracting to people that are on the lower end of the socioeconomic status by number one, trying to contain it where it is, but keep it where it is in ways that we can do that. We have political alliances, military alliances, and even economic aid. We provide money to these countries to help them rebuild. So hopefully people are doing very well and they are not as inclined to adopting a system of communism. So let's get into the real content here as we start diving into Asia. Again, this is just a, another way of seeing communism, a more visual representation. So think of it this way. Um, you are this lovely, lovely human right here. That's you, yay. Um, <clears throat> you have two very lovely, lovely, adorable cows here, cow one, cow two. Um, and you can use cows for a variety of different reasons. Usually people don't butcher cows right away. They use them for their milk, and this is something that can keep coming back to them. So say you own these cows. Under communism, you don't keep those two cows that you have. What happens is the government takes those cows. They'll give you some milk. So now this is you. You get some milk. So you get just what you need. You don't get to keep that excess. You don't really own um, that or keep that personal property. That personal property is given to the government for the good of the community, right? So the state or the government will provide you the commune so that you have a little bit and they can use the rest of it to use as whatever anybody else needs. It's a way of balancing things out. And usually what this is supposed to do is eliminate as this very, very cheesy meme here shows with Stalin is that it should eliminate class system. If everybody has the same, nobody can be poor because poor is a relative term. If I have, say, $100,000, right, usually most people would say, wow, you're doing pretty well for yourself, especially compared to a high school student. I'd be considered rich. If I go up and stand next to Bill Gates, I'm going to be seen as poor 
but to him, it's all relative. So if there is no difference in economic status, if everybody has the same, then class doesn't exist. Now, when we're talking about classes, the people that are typically on the lowest end economically, the poorest in society, are usually two types of people. And you can see these symbols represented on the Soviet Union's flag. There are two tools here that are used by different types of laborers. The first one you'll see right here is one that you may not know the name for, called the sickle. Maybe you've seen the Grim Reaper with a really, really long one on a stick called a scythe, but it's essentially the same thing. A sickle is a handheld version of it, a, a closer one-handed version that farmers use to chop down wheat or chop down the stalks of their crops. So it's a tool usually represented them. And the other one, hopefully you're able to recognize what that might look like, that would be a hammer. Hammers are used by industrial laborers. Um, and so it's these, these signs of people that are usually at the bottom rung of society. These are the people that have the most benefit. These are the people that the backbones of country are built off of. Laborers and industry and the farmers feeding. So just one last thing to review before we dive into new content. This is going to be a little bit of a flashback to what we already talked about in our last video, uh, our last segment where we talked about something called the Berlin Airlift. Now notice that Germany is completely divided here. Boom. Right here. This yellow one in this map is represented by yellow, is East Germany representing the Soviet Union, the communist government. And inside of that is the city of Berlin. And the city of Berlin is subdivided like this. Um, the city of Berlin is divided in a similar way as is um, Germany as a whole. And so this is just another example of that division that's happening. What is going to happen to try to prevent communism from spreading? The United States is going to flood Western Europe and West Germany with money to help it rebuild as quickly as possible. As that happens, including in West Berlin, people are going to flood from East Berlin to West Berlin. From East Germany to West Germany. And to prevent from all of these people from getting out, all of their laborers from getting out, Stalin is going to set up a blockade um, after this Marshall Plan comes through and all this money starts flooding through. This blockade is to prevent to stop people from leaving the city of Berlin or at least leaving to the western side. They're losing a lot of their major skilled laborers. They're losing a lot of their key workers. So Stalin shuts the gates all around. Now, the other thing that we can take note here is that West Berlin is completely surrounded on its eastern side is East Berlin, a communist government controlled by the Soviet Union. All around it is East Germany, which is an entire communist bloc. So we have a huge problem here. How is America going to get supplies to these people? How are we going to get these people help? How are we going to get them aid? Are we going to bomb them? Are we going to bring in our big army? Are we going to do a mass invasion? And the answer is no, none of those things. We fly in airplanes. We provide humanitarian aid. We're dropping food. We're dropping things like bread and meat and, and, and other supplies, like even in this case on this, milk. We're providing food and humanitarian aid to these people. Candy. We drop um, Hershey's chocolate right over, over Berlin. And it's a way that, yes, this conflict is handled. The blockade is going to end after a couple months and things are going to go back to a little bit level in Europe. But no war breaks out. In essence, the Cold War stays cold. If you're struggling to really get a good grip on what the Americans um, at this time view of communism or why they're afraid of it or why it's a bad idea, there's this really great cartoon you can watch, and this link is right here down at the bottom of this page. I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, this will take you to a video, and you'll see kind of characters, as you see here on the left. Um, a merchant comes into town selling a bottle, right? And this bottle he has in his hand here is a bottle that he called the bottle of ism, right? It's supposed to be a bottle of communism. And why it's so interesting to all of these different people, why might it sound interesting? And then by the end, you're going to see really kind of how dangerous it might be if you've ever seen, if you kind of remember the, the uh, Donald Duck cartoon in World War II, where he goes and he lives in Nazi land, and then he wakes up from a bad dream about why it's terrible. So we have four different people here on the far right. We have the farmer, right? We have our business owner, we have our industrial worker, 
and then we have our kind of wealthy merchant, our, our wealthy businessman. So there's a couple different people here and you get a couple different perspectives about how it could impact all areas of American life. It's a really good tool for you to check out. All right, now we're gonna get into where the Cold War actually gets a little hot, heating up a little bit. So we are gonna take a little bit of a look into this subject matter. So the first thing that we can really take a look at is when we're talking about militarily what's going on, there were a couple different new agencies or part of the government that were created just two years after World War II ends here in 1947 to hope that America can better respond to these problems. And one of them is called the Department of Defense. Um, it's a major part of the United States government today. It directs the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. The Air Force becomes really, really important because the Air Force is able to not only carry a lot of people around, you can drop bombs using this atomic weapon, you can be very mobile, you can get things around very quickly, and you can use it for recon, you can use it for spying, you can use it for getting information and taking pictures. So it becomes very, very interesting. The other thing that we have created is the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. They are gonna be all about gathering new forms of information, um, all the different government, um, amongst all the different government agencies and governments around the world, a lot of uh, infiltration of countries. So there's a lot of um, special things going on with the CIA because now there's this fear of espionage in our country. How are we gonna get rid of these spies? We're gonna have spies of our own. And lastly, we have something called the National Security Council. Now this is a picture of the Obama administration with um, the National Security Council. Um, what they do is they advise the president on anything dealing with um, something labeled as national security. So if there's a national threat abroad, these specialists will get their information, they'll research it, they'll figure out as much as they can, contact the other bureaus to try to figure out what they need to do, how they need to respond, what's the real situation going on there. Then they can bring all of this information to the president, answer any of his questions, give him advice on how to handle it. You have specialists dealing with all of these different types of situations. Now, we have these new organizations and governments so our government's getting ready for it, but militarily, we're getting ready too. At the end of World War II, we were the only country with nuclear capability. We're the only country with the atomic bomb. Problem is, is a couple years after World War II, we are no longer the only country with it. And guess which country has it? The USSR, the Soviet Union has created their own atomic weapon. This country that we're fighting with all around the globe, we're trying to have more influence than they are, we're equal now. We both have this same capable technology doing devastating things. Now the big problem with this is not just that, there's another big issue. We never told them how to do it. So if you and somebody else have a secret and you never told anybody, you know that that secret must have gotten leaked out somehow. Somebody must have overheard you in some way. In this case, what's going to happen is we're going to figure out that because we didn't tell anybody that they must have stolen those secrets. They're spies. This is when the duck and cover phenomena really begins when people start saying, oh my gosh, what happens if Soviets decide to bomb us? Will they? When they, how will they know, right? If they decide to do it, how are we going to react? Are we going to be safe? How can we protect ourselves? Spies have got into the highest level of the American government, the most secret project we've ever had in American history. They were inside of it and we didn't know and they stole our secrets. So that's a huge problem, number one. So America really tries to get back to work and they're still trying to have one up the Soviets. And after the Soviets test an atomic bomb, we kind of get really, really invested into trying to create our own weapon that's even more powerful. And we do just three years later. In 1952, America tests the very first hydrogen bomb. It's a different element where um, we're, we're, we're using hydrogen instead. The hydrogen bomb is like 1,000 atomic bombs dropped in a single instant. It is unbelievably devastating. Now, this has never been used in combat, but we demonstrate it and we release that information. This is a whole new level of warfare. But just a year later, the Soviets do the same thing. So if you really wanna take a look to see what it looks like, I'll leave this link 
down below, but you can just copy this up here and I'll take you right to that video. Um, it shows you kind of how they compare to each other, the atomic bombs that were dropped in um, on, on Japan along with American's hydrogen bomb and the largest weapon, the most devastating atomic weapon, um, the own hydrogen bomb of the Soviet Union called the Tsar Bomba, right? That you can see just how explosive it is in comparison and why are people really this freaked out? So now what we're going to do is we're going to start going into Asia. Now, a lot of these countries are, are countries that hopefully some of them will be able to identify. You may not be able to identify most of them or maybe even any of them, depending on your background and history. Um, some schools right, um, don't have any background in world history whatsoever, let alone old European history. So we've got a couple different countries here, some major ones. All of these four are ones that we're really gonna be dealing with. So number one, right here, right? This massive landmass country that extends all the way across Asia and into Europe here, that's gonna be the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is gonna be the country we're going toe to toe with. This big country here in red, very important country for us moving forward, that is gonna be the country of China. We're gonna be dealing with China not too long. The next country that we're gonna be dealing with this peninsula, right, that's going to ultimately come right here, right, that is Korea. And then in the 60s and 70s, we're really going to be dealing with the war in this country, and that's Vietnam. So you're going to have to brush up a little bit on your Asian geography because it's going to really help us understand this story in greater depth about what's going on here. Why do these countries um, become more relevant in each country? coming day or each coming discussion, but we're going to get into that further we touch on the topic. Now, as we start touching into this topic, we've done a lot of review and we're going to keep reviewing um, as we go, but understanding America's policy at this time. Our policy is containment, right? So this sandbox sort of represents the American policy. The sand inside would then be communism. It's cool when you're in the sandbox. Sand is great when you're at the beach but you don't want it to come out. You don't want it to get into your car. You don't want it in your bag. You don't want it um, in your pants. It's gross, it's weird. Nobody wants that. Um, so containment, you wanna keep it right where it is, right? Containment is keeping it, containing it, or like a container you use for food. Great when it's in the container and it's sealed and it stays where it is, that's fine. Eventually it'll get taken care of. But if you just let it free flow throughout your bag, if you have a can of chicken noodle soup, right, flowing through your bag, that's not really gonna turn out too well today, not to keep it happy. So here we are in Asia. So after World War II, America tries to help to set up some democracies um, in other countries. And, and one way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna sign um, an alliance treaty with Japan, but this is not gonna go very well with some other countries um, long-term. One example of this would be who Japan has a lot of issues with, to say the least, who they invaded in World War II. And think about the raping at Nanjing and Manchuria, that section of China. China is gonna become the first major country to um, go communist post-World War II. In the American point of view, we're gonna view this as losing China or China is falling to communists. A brand new revolutionary leader is gonna take charge and take power by the name of Mao Zedong. Mao is a hugely important figure. He's gonna be in power for the next 25 years, two and a half decades. You cannot forget about Mao. So Mao is gonna be a big figure for us. The reason why is not only does Mao take over and leads a successful revolution in China to take back control, he also signs a treaty with our number one enemy, his best communist ally that they can find, the Soviet Union. And one of the reasons why they sign this assistance treaty, this essentially alliance, is the United States refuses to recognize Mao as this new leader of this country. And the number one reason why is because he sets up a communist government. Communism, right, in these countries, in America wanting democracy, these things won't mix. For our point of view, you're either with us or you're against us. And in this case, we refuse to recognize them and China buddies up with the Soviet Union and Stalin and Mao will become good political allies. 
One reason that is also important is look at the geography right here. This big dark red blob is the Soviet Union, massive amount of country. The next largest country by far is going to be China, and that's gonna lead into influences into here, some other countries that we are gonna talk about. You're gonna see this maybe little country right here that looks a little different, split in half, that's Korea. Eventually we'll get into other countries down in Southeastern Asia, like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos down here, but we also have the Middle East buffer. So there's a lot of change that's gonna be happening in the Southern part of Asia. This is gonna dive us into our very first war. Now, what's unique about this story is really understanding that America is going to side with leaders, even if they're not popular, even in some cases where they're really not good people, um, just for the sake that they are democratic. Their philosophies may differ, but that's the one biggest thing that we are willing to support more than anything else, as long as they believe and put out a system of democracy and or capitalism, more so democracy. The public support, when you're looking between these two men at this chart down below, one big thing that we really see here is why Mao is so, so popular is he's really big on land reform, helping peasants, helping farmers. Um, he's really, really popular. His his message is national, uh, kind of national liberation. You could think of him as kind of like the um, like a George Washington type figure for the United States as Mao might be for the Chinese. But we have this, uh, this change um, in, in uh, morale and how the communists really have this wave going with a lot of support perhaps from the Soviet Union right to the north. And they're gonna use a lot of propaganda just like the United States does. For example, take a look at this poster. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say most of you um, watching this video do not know Mandarin. You do not know how to read it nor speak it, um, and that's okay. We can still use symbolism, right? We can use visuals. You may have heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? A couple of things I would like you to note, right? Understand that size is really important. Look at that picture right there of Mao in the sun, kind of like if you ever watch the Teletubbies, there's a big face in the sun, right? I always say that's kind of silly, but um, he's kind of like that in this regard, this major leader, um, and then notice the size of the people down below that they're loyal to him, that he is going to lead China into this new era. We also right, have other forms of propaganda that we saw in our country where we specifically put um, people of um, different professions or different fictions or different genders in the forefront of these posters to really draw these people to action. Think about what support does Mao have the most of. There's a couple people here. Think about what they're wearing, right? What type of profession they may have. One that might be easy to pick out, right? Might be this individual right here, right? Maybe you recognize him as a soldier for sure. And he's got a big red book in his hand. You may not know what that is and that's okay. But that's kind of, uh, you think about like the communist Bible in China. It's kind of a book of Mao's sayings and Mao's um, um, laws and teachings. And it's a way of kind of like law and order, right? We have a soldier. We have over here, perhaps a farmer. And also notice that she's a female, right? She's a female, got a bayonet down here, be scared. And then we also have industrial laborers. We have all different types of people, usually common people. These are not usually the high class individuals, but this is a people's movement. Think of that analogy. Look at that, loyal communists as well, right? We also, right, kind of see this message that the United States has gone through, many other countries have gone through. You're gonna struggle for a couple of years, but we're gonna change the face of our country. We're gonna catch up with the rest of the world. And Mao is gonna be able, with his Great Leap Forward campaign, to get this country moving in a more modern direction. Notice again, the farmers and the industrial workers, symbols of communism, the people that have the most benefit really using the most of the population to change how society is structured in China, right? And we're gonna really push this to a, a more modern end. And so to do that, there's need for resources and need for kind of the uh, dialect and the story, but it's gonna lead us into a lot of different conflicts here.
right? There's a lot of different propaganda. Um, the use of the phoenix over here on the left or the dragon on the right here. Um, notice what they're coming from. On the left, that phoenix um, is coming from a bushel of wheat from a farmer. And from the right, steel drum of an urban laborer, right? Both of these people together, the sign of power, of strength in ancient culture, which you're really going to see happen here. And that's the message and the motive. It's using techniques that people understand. This may not mean a lot to a Western European or, or, or an American and uh, North American, but this these symbols are much more common in Asian culture as you're going to hear. Now, the Chinese Civil War is going to happen. There's going to be this fight between um, the, the communist government and the nationalist government. Um, ultimately, this little island down here is the island of Taiwan. Um, the communist government is going to take over the mainland China, and they're going to repel and defeat the remaining um, nationalist forces. And so communism is going to take over the country. And Mao is going to be one of those massive influential leaders in the story of communism. We have Marx over on the far left, the father of communism. Lenin, um, who leads the um, revolution in um, Russia, turning it into the Soviet Union before Stalin takes over, and then now Mao um, taking that charge, who is a hugely important figure. But again, all of these things are happening. You really got to have to latch down on one major major thing here, because this is going to decide how Americans are going to react in the future. Americans fear that the rest of the world is going to fall to communism. We feel like we lost China. We should have kept China democratic and we lost it. And so because of that, because we fail to contain communism successfully, American paranoia is really gonna set in. We're gonna fear like, oh my gosh, this is the worst possible scenario. What else could happen next? And it's going to breed um, a philosophy or a theory called the domino theory. The domino theory, you can think about, maybe you've seen those crazy YouTube videos where people set up these giant trains of dominoes and they set them all through the house and in this huge mechanism. And think about what happens when you knock that first one over. It hits the next one. And then the next one. And the next one starts picking up steam, and the next one, and the next one. It hits down this entire chain around the entire house, the entire property, after just knocking over one. When we take that analogy and we apply it to communism in other countries, Americans are going to really kind of buy into this domino theory. That if we let one country fall to communism, the next one's going to fall. The next one, the next one, the next one. So America's got to wedge its foot in there and stop this from happening. So after China falls right here, Americans say, oh, my God, what's next? Is it going to be Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia? Where is this story going to end? So Americans are really going to take the battlefront to Korea next and try to stop this massive chain of events from happening. So the only other thing I'd really like you to do um, to work on this is you're going to complete the Korean War um, worksheet, a nice little introduction to the Korean War. You can take a look um, and learn about some of the backgrounds. And in our next video, we'll talk a little bit more explicitly about what's happening in the Korean War there. Again, as always, if you have any questions, drop comments down in the section below. Other than that, peace.